For me, the sole purpose of owning these old military rifles is to shoot them, for it is this solitary aspect that truly clarifies their history and places them in the context of their era. But it is not just simply shooting them that I refer to, but rather shooting them as well as possible. For now, as it was then, hitting what you are aiming at was, and is, of primary importance. In this series of videos, we'll discuss the steps necessary to enable the Mark III Snyder long rifle to provide the highest degree of satisfaction through hitting what it is aimed at. Working up at 100 yards. Part 1. Here, we'll discuss some terms and procedures used in working up. We'll talk about determining variables used in various loads and configurations, establishing a comprehensive approach, and the theory of a group. For most, if not all, antique Victorian arms, service ammunition is unavailable. This necessitates making your own. Because of this, matching components to those used long ago is not always possible. So in using facsimile ammunition, the proverbial slate is wiped clean. In order to establish a new one, a shooter must undergo a process sometimes known as working up. It might be beneficial at this time to talk about some terms used in marksmanship. The point of aim, or POA, is where you place your sight picture on the target. The mean point of impact is the average point in which your grouping lies, essentially group center. The intended mean point of impact, or correct zero point, refers to the point where you wish your mean point of impact to be on the target in relation to your point of aim. Combined with these terms, there are two main procedures used in working up. Grouping and zeroing. Grouping refers to the process of adjusting variables and components to enable the rifle to shoot most consistently. That is to say, in shooting a given number of rounds, they will be as close as possible to one another. Note also that this process pays no heed to where those rounds hit the target. Zeroing is the process of adjusting sights or sight pictures so that your point of aim and your intended mean point of impact are where you want them to be in relation to one another. In this example, the rifle is shooting high with an MPI well above the point of aim. In this example, the MPI has been brought down through adjustment of the sights so that it more accurately matches the intended mean point of impact. The first step I use in grouping is the determining of the variables. These include the load, which will consist of the type of powder and the amount of powder, selecting the bullet, which may have different weights, diameters, or profiles, and the selection and possible inclusion of other components, such as fillers or wads. For powder, there are two types that I commonly use, 2F and 3F. Now, other brands have different offerings, but as I use GoX due to availability, it is these two granulations that I use most often. Although not necessarily advertised as being for larger calibers, 3F is what I use in all my Enfield muskets. So when Snyders are concerned, well, they are very similar. It is important, of course, to remain safe, and the loads I selected for each powder were within tolerances, from 65 to 75 grains of 2F, and from 57.5 to 65 grains of 3F. Typically, a 3F load that is 10% less than a given load of 2F is a rule of thumb to adopt. Overall, I find 3F to be cleaner burning, and, as you need less of it to achieve similar results, it's slightly more economical. A quick point on the measurement of powder. A grain is equal to 1 7,000th of a pound, and therefore is a measure of weight. Handheld or mounted volumetric measures are very handy but it's important to realize that the graduations on these are not necessarily reflective of the true measurement, and the only way to arrive at that true measurement is in fact to weigh your powder charges. Once you've set these volumetric measures to throw the appropriate volume of powder that yields a specific weight, they are most useful indeed. In this demonstration, with the volumetric measure set to 80 grains, 2F powder is used. When the measure is emptied onto a calibrated scale, we see that the true measurement is some 74.4 grains, not the 80 as prescribed. By way of further demonstration, 
when the use of 3F powder is concerned, it being more fine and therefore compacting more densely into the measure, we see that using similar procedures that the result is in fact 77 grains, although the measure was set to the same 80 grains. The next variable we'll talk about is the bullet. There are many bullets that you can shoot out of a Snyder, but only a few that will yield decent results. In a previous video, we examined the use of undersized expanding bullets, nominally 0.575 in diameter, in the Snyder reloading videos, and we will not examine them to the same degree here. As expressed in those videos, groove depth is the way to go for truly satisfactory results, and the 0.600 X-Ring Services Snyder bullet is what I went with immediately when I started experimenting with my Snyders. There are other offerings in the groove size Snyder bullet world. Martin also stocks another type of Snyder bolt shown here. This one's not as heavy and, as you can see, of slightly different design. CBE in Australia also has their own Snyder bolt. And NOE from the United States has their version as well. There are opportunities as well to craft your own custom mold. Now, the variations of these are only limited by your imagination. Guy and Leonard West who run their own YouTube channel out of the UK, have conducted some interesting experiments with their own custom Snyder bullet. Mimicking the design of the little-known Japanese Snyder bullet, they modified a Lyman mold so that it casts a different kind of base cavity, mimicking the cavity found in that Japanese bullet. This, combined with a custom-made and appropriately sized base plug mold, provided for extreme accuracy in their case. In the end, it's up to you which one you choose, depending on the type of shooting you may want to do. Just remember, groove diameter is what you're aiming for. There are other components used in this type of ammunition that need to be considered, namely fillers and wads. As explained in the Snyder ammunition video, a filler is needed to take up the extra space in the casing, as typical loads do not even come close to filling them. In the case of the Snyder, some sort of non-compressible filler is used. Cornmeal, cream of wheat cereal, or semolina are usual good choices. Typically, the amount of these fillers corresponds inversely to the amount of powder used. The more powder, the less filler, and so on. This is to ensure the bullet remains at its appropriate seating depth. Another solution used by some to great success is a small, appropriately sized piece of foam backer rod used to insulate around windows. Next, we'll talk about wads and wad columns. Although not absolutely necessary for functioning of a Snyder cartridge, the consideration of adding some or many different kinds of wads may be appropriate to your specific rifle and loading. Some have found success with lubricated felt wads. When I began loading for my Snyder, I included the addition of a wad column. Thinking that I might include as much lubrication in the mix as possible, I elected to include a grease cookie sandwiched between three card wads. While this method had been effective in the Martini Henry cartridge, I found later, after much experimentation, that this combination was actually detrimental to Snyder accuracy. The solution, of course, was found through trial and error, and I found that by including the non-compressible filler, in my case cornmeal, and a single card wad above it, the best consistency was arrived at. Just remember that every rifle is different and will need, in effect, its own pet load to truly maximize its capabilities. Wads or no wads, cookies or no cookies, cornmeal or foam backer rod, this is all up to you, the shooter, to find which combination works best. So we've discussed some of the variables that we need to take into consideration when working up our Snyder. For me, a comprehensive approach is desirable, and for this, a table might be appropriate. Here, we'll demonstrate a systematic approach to grouping our rifle. At the top, you see columns for the serial, the powder, the bullet, wads, and the filler, not all of which may be applicable. The first series of groups we'll shoot all are shot with 2F powder, the 530 grain X-ring bullet, a card wad, and cornmeal filler. Based on the increments of powder we're using, this results in five different groups shot. Next, we'll try a different type of powder, in this case 3F, with an additional four groups shot, resulting in a total of nine. 
Now, for instance, let's say we have access to a different type of bullet. For sake of argument, let's say we're using the 440 grain X-Ring Bumblebee bullet. We have to repeat this whole process, giving a total of 18 groups. Now, to this, we add a different combination of wads and fillers. The example I'm using here is what was discussed earlier, three card wads and a grease cookie with no filler. But it's also important to realize that this could represent any combination of wads or fillers that you decide on. As you can see, by doing this and still wanting to remain comprehensive, this yields a total of 36 groups that need to be shot. Before we go further, an explanation of the theory of a group might be of some use. When a series of rounds, no less than three, are fired at a target, they will never hit in exactly the same location. This is due to a great number of factors, some material, some human, and some atmospheric. The measure of how well a rifle will group will increase proportionally to the number of rounds fired. As mentioned, the minimum is three, and a 95% certainty is arrived at after shooting 20 rounds. For any serious shooting, a minimum of five rounds should be used, but 10 to 20 will provide much more clarity and useful information. Understandably, 20 rounds is a lot to ask when dozens of groups need to be shot. And although it was this number used in Victorian times to measure performance, I typically settle on 10. As a closing remark on the subject, three round groups do have a use. After grouping and zeroing has been completed, they are useful and economical to confirm one zero, but more on that later. Next, we'll demonstrate this theory by examining two groupings shot with over five rounds. In this first example, the first three rounds shot are spaced widely apart. Now perhaps this is indicative of poor shooting or bad load development. Or is it? Because as we examine the next three rounds, they are all placed quite close together. So if we were to use a three round grouping system, which three rounds would we look at? given that any three rounds in any order could have been shot hypothetically. Which three round group would be the one to use to measure the performance of this particular load? The answer, of course, is neither of them, as these two individual three round groups are part of a larger ten round group. It is in fact this ten round group that demonstrates the capabilities of this load and rifle in this particular case. In the second example, the same principle is demonstrated only in reverse. The first three rounds are close together, but after that, the hits begin to spread apart. Again, given that any of these rounds may have been fired as the three, quote unquote, be they close or far apart, the only answer as to the true capabilities of the rifle is to take the greater number of rounds, in this case eight, as the best example. So this concludes part one of the Snyder Workup series. Armed with some theory, mastery of the variables, and having adopted a comprehensive approach, we're ready to start shooting in earnest. In part two of this series, we'll talk about shooting of the groups, the collection of data, turning that data into useful information about your loads, as well as how to zero your rifle and adjust your sights. <laughs>